Uh, wow, Val, thank you so much um, for your story, and just uh, it's amazing to see. If this is your first time to NHCC, welcome. I'm Pastor David. This is Pastor Josiah. He's going to be joining me this week as we continue in our series into the living room. And if this is your first time, here's what we've been going through. We started this series last week called The Living Room, and the point is this, that when you enter into this church, we want it to feel like it's a living room where you feel comfortable enough to talk about your issues. You feel comfortable to talk about problems you're dealing with, sins you're dealing with, whatever it is that we as a church would literally gather around you, link arms with you, and walk with you during your journey. Walk with you wherever you're at, mindset, whatever it is, that we'd be able to help and guide just like Jesus did. And so many times we read in, in, in the Gospels how many, like Peter, walking away from God. And, and, and what did Jesus do when he came back? He's forgiven. And he said, let's just keep moving on. Let's move forward. And, and so the point is, is that today where wherever you're at, we want this place to be like the living room where you can be honest, real, vulnerable, open up about those things. Because here's the reality. If we're all honest this morning, we're all dealing with something. Can we agree, church? Any hands out there? Yeah, we're all dealing with something. And, and that's reality. And the point is, there's answers for those things. And so what we've been doing is we've been looking at God's word, looking at um, these people that God used, because I feel like at times we feel like it's distant. You know, we, we have the word of God and we read about these people and we go, yeah, well, you know, how can I be David or how can I be so-and-so? And that's impossible. The reality is all of these people were human. You just hear me? They were human. And so as we, as we see these people and what God's done in their life, many of them made major mistakes, but God still used them. Can we get a shout of praise this morning for that? It's, it's absolutely true. And so we, that's encouraging to read. But the point is, as we look at these people in God's word, that we would see that we are no different we're human, just like them. And yes, they were empowered by God, obviously, but we are as well. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us the minute we say yes to Jesus. So that same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead now lives inside of you. So you cannot tell me that you can't do something big for God's glory because that power lives in you. And so we can do amazing things for God's glory, just like these men and women that we will look at over this series did in their time. And as we looked at last week, we talked about David, right? King David, as, as many of us would say, man, what a, what a man of God, right? The Bible says he had, a, he had a heart after God's own heart. But what did we hear last week? That yes, David and Goliath, he slays the giant. He does these amazing things. He becomes king. But then what happens? He ends up cheating on somebody that's in his army, as I mentioned, a coworker, right? If we were thinking of today's time frame and having an affair. And then he sends someone to actually kill or puts that man in the front lines at an army and he has him killed so he can be with his wife. Does that sound jacked up? It is. Remember last week I said it's like a Netflix documentary. That's what's taking place here. And then the child ends up dying. And then what happens after that? Because she gets pregnant and he tries to hide it and all these things. I mean, just horrible, horrible stuff. And because of David's thing and what he, he did, what ends up happening is 70,000 people later on end up dying because of the consequences of sin that David committed. So now he has 70,000 people's lives hanging on his shoulders. But guess what? God continued to use him. It's called forgiveness. Grace, mercy, love. And it's truly amazing to see. And I'm mind blown as we read about these people going like, are you serious, God? Like, this is crazy. But the reality is, it shows his grace more and more and more. And it's truly amazing to see. And so as we've been walking through this, and we looked last week at the demon-possessed man as well, just an amazing story of, of Jesus face to face with this man, but talking with him, speaking with him. And then as we see the demons casted into the pigs and then, and then throwing themselves into the depths of the sea and drowning, that's our sin. He he takes it, throws it into the ocean, and it dies there because he paid the price. That's truly amazing and a beautiful story. So today, we're going to look at a man named Elijah. And I've been asking all the pastors that are going to be with me each week as we continue in the series. I asked Josiah, I said, Josiah, 
you know, who would you like to speak on if we're talking about somebody? And he said, Elijah. And I said, why? He's like, because I feel the most connected with this man and his mentality. And so you're going to see uh, his story this morning. Uh, don't fear, though. It's okay. Uh, uh, Josiah's great. He's perfectly fine. Um, and, and really, really excited for him to walk us through this. But he's going to be reading the text. And we're going to just basically kind of have a conversation up here and, and, and just be real about these things that we're going to read in, in just a second. Because today, Honestly, the words we're going to read are really heavy. They're really, really heavy. And, and many of us, I, can, I could say across the world, especially here in Utah Valley, struggle with this idea we're going to be speaking about. And so we want to be real, as I've mentioned. We want to be honest. And we want to be vulnerable. And so again, everything that you can imagine under the sun is in the Bible. And it's amazing that we get to read other people dealing with it because we can see what God does through it. And we can see that there is hope, 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 hope. And it's truly amazing to see. So welcome, Pastor Josiah. Please, let's give him a round. If you weren't here last week, we prayed over his family. And he's officially a pastor at NHCC. And so we're excited to have the altar rings here in ministry with us. But uh, Josiah, let's, let's jump in. So we're in 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. But before that, I'll have Josiah kind of set the scene. Give us a little bit about uh, Elijah and, and who he was. Um, so, 1 Kings uh, chapter 17 is where we first see Elijah, um, and his introduction is just completely out of the blue, and you could spend an entire message just talking about chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, but it says that Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, went before Ahab and said, as the Lord God of Israel stands, or as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there will not be rain in Israel these years until I say so. And then for the next three years, he goes off and he's fed by ravens at a brook until the brook dries up. And then he has to go and he's living with a widow. And because he's staying with this widow, she's provided for during the entire famine. And then three years later, he goes and he calls a showdown with Ahab. And that's chapter 18. This epic chapter where Elijah is revealed to be uh, the servant of the living God and the servants of Baal are uh, just completely baffled at the lack of response they get from the God that they worship. Um, and so after this, Elijah thinks he sees this huge revival as the people of Israel, their hearts seem turned back to Yahweh. Um, and uh, they uh, they slay the prophets of Baal. Uh, Elijah prays for rain. Rain comes. Elijah outruns Ahab's chariot back to the capital, which is just fantastic. Um, and that's where uh, chapter 19 picks up with uh, Elijah and Ahab chilling in the capital. So what we see in the very beginning of, the, of this man's life that we see in scripture is, one, he says, hey, it's not going to rain. Yeah. So first of all, just get a glimpse of Elijah. Normal human right? God's using him. He says, hey, it's not going to rain, everyone. And it doesn't rain. And so that's one. It's just massive miracle, right, in what's taking place. And there's famine that takes place. But then as that's happening, obviously, if there's no rain, there's no food, yeah. right? They can't grow anything. There's nothing that can take place. So there's famine that takes place in the land. And then he meets a widow, right? Yeah. That widow's son ends up dying yeah. because of the famine that's taking place. But here's what's amazing is Elijah then raises this son back to life. First time it ever happens in the Bible. I mean, incredible, right? One of, the, one, of, one of the very few times we see someone actually coming back to life yeah. in God's word. And so Elijah is a part of that. But not only that, but they don't have food. So then what does he also say? I think it's in verse 14 of chapter 17. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. Yeah. So he promises this widow and her son, hey, this jar of clay here, this, this, this pot of flour, that, that, or a jar, jar of oil and, and this flour here, it should never be used up. So basically every single morning after they, they ate, they, they'd wake up again and it'd be filled again. Talk about miracles, right? So every day they were being fed. And so Elijah's a part of this. So I want you guys to really understand that what's taking place, that Elijah's doing incredible things. Not only is he praying there wouldn't be rain, then there's no rain, and then all of a sudden he's, he's with a widow that there's no food at all, but this food is coming every single morning. God's providing. Sun dies. 
He raises the son from the dead. Powerful stuff here that's taking place. And then a massive um, kind of um, in Mount Carmel, the victory that takes place after that that you mentioned. And then now we're in chapter 19. So get a glimpse really quick of Elijah's life. What he's done. What God's done through him. And then the words that he, he pens after this. And so go ahead. Chapter 19 starting in verse 1. Uh, so it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So you see right away as he's, you know, running, or, or this message gets, gets told, and these people are basically saying, Look, we're against you. We're going to find you and kill you, is what essentially they're saying. Right, and so his response that you see in, in verse 4 is he himself went on a day's journey. He goes into the wilderness and he comes and he sits down under a broom tree. And again, listen to the words he's saying here. He says, and he prayed that he might die. That's heavy. He's saying, Lord, I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to die. So again, getting, get, stepping back really quick. Everything that Elijah did, you know, the couple chapters before this, the miracles that, that took place, what he saw God doing, and even up to this point, what he saw God doing. And he prays that he might die. This is, this is where the reality hits, right? That no matter where you're at in your life, whether good, bad, I mean, everything's going well. Like, it, 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 amazing things are taking place. And yet the minute he gets one last threat, because I'm sure there's many threats that come, sure. you know, before this. But as he gets that threat that, that somebody's headed their direction, no matter what, he, he's, I think at this point, it's like, dude, do you remember what God just did? Do you see what he did? But he says, and he prays that he might die. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy to read that because it's like, Elijah, what, what are you thinking in this moment? But it shows you that any one of us can be in that mentality. Sometimes we're in our darkest moments. Darkest, darkest moments. And I love that we can actually read it. Because he says this, it, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. What a sad statement. But he's being honest, open, vulnerable, real, right? As he's saying these things, he's, he's saying, look, this is, this is my heart. This is exactly what is in, inside of, of me at the moment. So he's afraid for his life. Um, Josiah, what do, you, what do you think at this point? I mean, again, everything he's been through. Yeah. Um, so I think what, like, it says that Elijah sees the message from Jezebel and then he runs for his life, but less than 24 hours later, he's praying that God would end his life. And so there has to be more to it than just he's running to preserve his life because he's ready to give it up just a day later. And so I really think that what Elijah's going through is that he just saw um, what he thought and what he expected to be a change in the hearts of the people of Israel. And we'll see later that he feels completely isolated, completely alone. Um, and like everything that he did over the past three years was a complete waste mm -hmm. because now the rain's back and now his life is under threat and nothing seems to have changed. And I think it's that expectation that he had to see something massive and just his expectations weren't met. And he realizes that all of this effort that he put himself into mm -hmm. was not enough for what he wanted to see. Yeah. And it, it's that uh, expectation not being met. It's his plans not going the way he had planned. Has anyone ever been there? <laughs> if we're super honest, right? 
the plans that you want, it doesn't happen the way that you want it to, to go. I think, uh, Josiah, you said this, but it's, it says Elijah was disappointed and it felt like a failure. Yeah. If we wrap that part up, right? Yeah. He felt disappointed because people weren't turning away. He, he, he tried so hard to preach the gospel, tell them, hey, this is what's happening. Guys, you got to repent. You can't have these idols, these things. But he was so disappointed at this time because everyone, basically, he felt, like you said, alone. Yeah. Alone. But what just took place before this? And yet he still felt alone. I think there's so many times where we as Christians, we, we say, oh, we can't feel that way. Or, you know, uh, a Christian can't be depressed. Or a Christian can't deal with anxiety. Or a Christian can't deal with these things. Wrong. Yep. Wrong. And so many times it's, you have a brother or sister come to you, oh, you shouldn't feel this way. Is God not enough? No, he is enough. Amen. He absolutely is enough. But the point is, we're human. The point is, we see failure in ourselves. The point is, there's times where we feel disappointed. There's times where we feel like, God, what are you doing? Why do I feel this way? You know, why is this, why did this happen? I mentioned last week why we even started this series was because of losing a friend who was dealing with something in his life. And that thing he dealt with ultimately took him. But the point is, though he accepted Jesus, gave his life to the Lord, he still dealt with it. It's still there. And it still can be. Can God cure it? Absolutely. He absolutely can. But the, the point is that there will be times where we're going to lose close friends, close family members because of the sins of the world, because of the enemy. That doesn't mean the enemy wins. God wins. We read it at the very end, right? It's true. But the point is, there's real things that we go through, and it's very difficult at times to go through it. And just like we see in Elijah, as he says there at the end, he's disappointed. He felt like a failure, and he says, you know what? I don't even want to be here anymore. What's it sound like? Depression. What, what else does it sound like? Fear. Suicide? Suicidal thoughts? I don't want to be here anymore. It seems better just to go. That's what he's saying. And so as I mentioned before, this is heavy stuff we're talking about. It isn't just something we can blow over and go, oh, okay, let's just keep going. Like, it, it's not that way. It's, it, this man dealt with this. He dealt with it. But here's what James says. If we, if we take a step way forward, James in chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. So he mentions again just the, the reality that Elijah was human just like us, but he prayed for something radical that took place. Then he prayed again and he brought the rain, but also that he's human and he dealt with depression, fear, anxiety, you name it. We can see it right there. And we're going to see in just a little bit how close he was to God and yet still felt that way. We know there's hope and we're going to get there. But the point is, if this is you today, say something. Say something. And we as a church body should open those people that are feeling this exact way, open up our arms and we would grab a hold of them. We wouldn't let them go. Because we need more of that today. Not more people bashing other people because of their sins, but us grabbing them as a, as a brother, as a sister, grabbing hold of them, bringing them in and say, we're going to walk with you. Remember in Psalms last week when we were reading? It says, in the valley of the shadow of the death, right? As you're walking in this valley that is so dark, it feels like death, where there's no light whatsoever. You feel that way. And what does David say? That God's with him every step of the way. And so it's just, again, the reality that we see. In Psalm 73, 26, it says this, My health may fail, and my spirit may grow weak. This is, this is exactly what's happening, I believe, to Elijah. Would you agree? It's happening right here, where he's saying, my health, my health may fail, my spirit may grow weak. His spirit is weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. 
So in those times where you feel weak, right? We, we know this, the Bible says, when we're weak, he is strong. Right? So it's good to be weak. It's talking about humility. When we are humble, when we're at our lowest, it's saying God is the strongest because we realize who God is in our life. That he has to be the strongest. We can't be. It has to be him. But in that moment where our spirit feels weak, God remains the strength of my heart and he is mine forever. Josiah, what do you think when we read that text? It's saying spirit grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Well, I think what's interesting, especially about um, that in relation to this passage is Elijah is chilling underneath a broom tree right now. Like if he wanted to kill himself, he could. But while his thoughts are suicidal, he's still relying on God. He's saying, God, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I don't know if you're done, but I think this is enough. Let me die. This is my request. And so often there's prayers that we have that things that we want that don't get answered. In this case, it's a really good thing that it wasn't <laughs> answered. Um, but he's, he's still relying on God even in this moment when his spirit's weak. And he's saying, this is my desire, but I'm still relying on you. I ask you to take my life. Wow. Wow. He's... He's literally handing his life over to the Lord, saying, yeah. do, do what you will. Yeah. And again, again, a beautiful picture is he's saying, I'm done. How many of you, if we're honest today, you can raise your hand, you don't have to, have ever been in that place where I'm done? I'm raising my hand with you. You just feel like I'm done. I can't do this. It's too difficult. It's too hard. And I have been asked this literally last week. I was having a conversation uh, with a buddy of mine, and he's saying, like, recently I got into a car accident and these things, and he was saying uh, just about his life, and he's asking, you know, why, why didn't I die? You know, why didn't this take place? And I go, I, I don't have an answer for you, man, but I, I can tell you this, God's not done with you. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I've been in two major accidents in my life, both where I should have died myself, one, flying off a 30-foot cliff. Radical story, I'll tell you later. <laughs> and two, I hit a semi going 80 miles an hour in a little Honda hatchback, green Honda hatchback. And when the cop showed up and, and he came around the semi because I slammed into the back of it, he, he came around the corner and he said, wow, I, didn't think you, I, think you're, I thought your head was going to be in the back seat. I said, what? You don't say that to someone when you walk <laughs> up here. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, every single time I've ever come to an accident like this, it's because when the car goes underneath the semi, usually the bumper decapitates them. And he's like, how did that not happen? I said, well, actually, I fell asleep at the wheel. And so when I fell asleep, I laid down to the right. And so when I hit the semi, I was laying down. And he goes, wow, you're a lucky kid. <laughs> Right? In my mind, I'm thinking, no, God saved my life. And that's the point is in this moment, too, where you, you, whether you go through car accidents, whatever it is, and you ask the question, why, 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 why? I, I, you know, we don't know. Well, I can't ever give you the exact answer, but I could say this. God's not done with you. God's not done. And so if that is the case, where you've had that moment where life glimpses in front of your eyes, you know, and you see the, the past of everything, and then all of a sudden you live, it's like, I hope you're more empowered than ever to go proclaim God's name in that moment. Because he's not done with you. Even in your darkest moments, darkest moments, we see that God's not done. And, he, and we're going to see in a second as he continues on and, and what takes place after this. If you want to continue reading Josiah in verse 5. So verse 5 says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. It was gluten-free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So again, we see he goes to this area, right? He sits under this broom tree. He, he, he cries out to the Lord saying, I'm done. You know, I, I, I don't want to be here. Um, and basically, again, he's... he's 
he wants to be free of that anxiety. He wants to be free of that fear. He wants to just rest. You know, he's like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Then here's what's so interesting. God provides for him right after this. This is amazing that we see here. So it's not just an angel. First of all, an angel comes and touches him. Uh, radical. Just radical, right? Angel shows up and he's like, hey, wake up. You're probably like, what? <laughs> what is going on? You, you wake up, you see an angel. It's like, okay, this is crazy. And, and then he goes, hey man, you need to eat. Get up and eat. And he gets up and eat. And, and he eats. And then he goes back to bed and he gets up again and he eats. The, the point is God's providing. He's providing. What do you think? Well, I think this, again, just points back to Elijah's willingness to rely on God, where he's out in the wilderness. He didn't bring any provisions. He says, all right, God, let me die. And then an angel wakes him up and says, hey, I have some food and water for you. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, all right. And then he eats it and he drinks and he's like, all right, I'm just going to go back to bed now. And I'm all right if I don't wake up. I'm, I'm just going to go to sleep. And then the angel wakes him up again. And he's like, no, okay, it's time to eat and drink. You, you got a long walk ahead of you. Yeah. And so at that point, Elijah um, I mean, I, I don't know what his attitude is right now, but he's going to uh, Horeb, Mount Sinai, where God appeared to Moses and spoke with Moses. So, like, the part of me that really relates to Elijah is thinking that he's, like, going to really plead his case before God. Just like, no, please, just let me die. Yeah. Just like, if I'm going to be here and you're not going to answer, I need to talk this out with you directly. But he's has that reliance on God and he's like, okay, I'm going to eat, I'm going to drink, I'm going to have this time where God's providing refreshment and then I'm going to go talk to God yeah. and sort it out with him. Yeah. The other side of that too is, again, we just see him just saying what he just said, right? And then the next thing that God does, he doesn't have a conversation with him. He doesn't say, why do you feel that way? He's not, he's not asking, you know, these, these, having a dialogue with Elijah. Instead, he sends him food and he continues to provide for him. I love it because it's like his darkest moment where he's saying, I'm giving up, I'm done. And then God just shows up. And he says, you're not done. I need you to eat because there's more. There's more. I got bigger things in store for you, man. We got to keep going here. Move forward. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing because I, when you take a look at that, you go, Lord, how good you are. You're, you're truly amazing. That you didn't stop and say, all right, Elijah's done. <laughs> He's done. He doesn't want to be here anymore. He doesn't want to deal with this. I, I can't work with him anymore. This is impossible now. <laughs> right? He, he doesn't say that. Instead, he sends an angel. He goes, feed my servant. Feed him. He's got to get some strength. Because there's bigger things to come. Yeah. He doesn't stop. And I love that because it shows God's heart towards us. That we could be in our darkest moments. We can be in those times where we're saying we're done. It's over and those things. And God can say, no, I'm not done yet. There's plenty more to do. But it also shows his forgiving heart towards us. It also shows that grace he has for us. It shows his mercy. It shows his love desperately towards us. And it's truly amazing to see his heart. In Psalm 42.11, says this, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. When you think about those, those questions, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I think you could probably agree where there's times where you have said that, or I have said that. It's like, Lord, why am I so discouraged today? Why am I so sad? Why am I so upset? Why are these things happening? Anyone with me? Been there? You ask those questions, the why questions, right? Constantly, why God? Why is this taking place? And then after that, I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. How can we do that, Josiah? What do you think? Well, I think, again, the focus, and this happens so often in the Psalms, it's why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And you're introspective. You're looking at yourself and how much you lack. Yeah. And I think when you look deep enough at how much you lack, you'll see how much God has and how he can wow. fill that lack. Wow. And so it turns from why am I discouraged? Why is my heart sad? To I will put my hope in God. Yeah. And God's going to be taking care of me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. 
It's good. It's good. Go ahead, Josiah. Continue reading in verse 9. Uh, so it says, And there Elijah went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and tore down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Wow. So we see here, he goes and he, and he has a conversation, right? And, and he goes up to the mountain here. And, and what's truly incredible is, as it mentions these crazy things, that there's a great wind that tore through the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, just like that took place before, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You see these, these epic things taking place, right? And it's saying, yes, th these are massive, you know, God's doing it, but it's saying he's not in there. And then at the very end, it says a still, small voice. What do you think, Josiah? Explain that. Well, so Elijah's there on the mountain in the cave. He's waiting to receive from God. And he hears God say, what are you doing here? And then he gives his spiel. And God says, go out on the mountain. And he goes, and there's the wind, the earthquake, the fire. And then he had already heard from God, but then he hears God again, this time in a still, small voice. Mm -hmm. And it's just prompting him to draw even closer. Yeah. Where God had already spoken to him. Elijah's already hearing from God. But when God speaks to him in that small voice, that soft voice, that voice that's prompting him to come closer and closer and closer. That's when Elijah receives from the Lord the direction that he's supposed to go. Yeah. Yeah. I think many times in our life, you know, we, we want to see these massive things like the earthquake, the fire, you know, God show up in this big, big way. And I want to hear from you. And I don't feel like I'm hearing from you. And he's like, David, <laughs> you're just not listening. And it's so crazy because it's just like, you're right, Lord. I'm looking in the wrong places. I, I think it always has to be this way because what I was taught or what I was told or it has to look like this or it has to look like that. And he's saying, David, listen, I'm here. And in that darkest moment that Elijah's in, that still small voice speaks to him. And he says this. I'm not done. What a beautiful picture. No matter what season we're in, we just have to listen. We got to pay attention. We have to be willing to shut off the noise and the chaos. And even in the midst of the chaos and all the noise and all the earthquakes and all the fire, wherever it is, in the midst of those things, we have to learn to listen, pay attention, and hear that still small voice when God speaks. It's hard. It's difficult. But as he says this again, he's saying, I'm not done. 
In Psalm 5.3, it says this, Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. What do you think about that verse? Um, in context to what we're talking about. Yeah, so what it really comes down to is that um, Elijah, I mean, he heard from God from the very beginning, three and a half years ago. He's yeah heard that he's supposed to go and tell this to Ahab. He lived obeying God's instructions this entire time. Elijah knows that God is alive. He knows that God is there. He knows that uh, Yahweh is the true God of yeah. Israel and not Baal. And um, he just waits on God. Yeah. And he goes to God. He goes to receive from him and hear from him what God has for him. Yeah. And he's this entire time, even in the midst of his depression, even in the midst of his wanting his life to just be done, he's just fed up with everything that's going on around him. He still relies on God and still waits, again, expectantly, like the Psalm says, waits to receive from God. Yeah. So many times people go, I, I want an answer. You know, I, I pray for an answer. I, I, wanna, I wanna hear from God. I, I don't know, you know, what, decision to make in, in my life at this point or this point in my life and you know people go how do I get that answer how do I do those things and I mean this this is this is the answer is listen to us that still small voice are you listening are you paying attention more importantly as this psalm says listen to my voice in the morning Lord each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly it's it's the psalm as David saying is saying listen to my voice but look what he says each morning I bring my request to you and wait what does that mean that each morning he's going to God. Each morning he's spending time with him. Each morning he's bringing his request to God. And, he's, and, and then not only is he bringing it to him and saying, you have to answer me now, God. No, he says what? He waits expectantly. But he doesn't just wait. What's the other word? Expectantly. He expects God to move. And we need to do the same. Wait expectantly. Wait knowing that God is going to do something. It may not look like the way we want it to look, though. Do you hear me, church? Because a lot of times we want it to look one way and it doesn't look that way. That doesn't mean God didn't show up. That means you're too focused on, guess who? You. You're too focused on what you want. You're too focused on the path you want to take, the car you want to buy, whatever it is. You're too focused on you. And he's saying, I got something else for you. And it's much better than you can ever imagine. So he waits expectantly, but he brings it each morning. If you want to hear God, spend time with him. If you want to know what he has for your life, talk to him. If you want to know what's, what, what you need to grow in, where you're, you're, you have a hard heart, he, let him reveal that to you. But you got to spend time with him. That's the only way. The only way. If you're saying, I'm not hearing from God, and I ask you, are you spending time with him? No. You answered it yourself. How do you hear from him? Spend time with him. Talk to him. Have a conversation. It's okay. If you're angry, yell. What, is he going to be mad? No, he wants to hear from you. He wants to know that you're listening. He wants to know that you realize he's there in that valley, in that darkest moment. But he's just saying, you're not listening. Hear my voice. And we can. We have to spend time with him. Well, we see through this text, and, and we'll end here because, or we'll end with these last couple of verses because we'll see what's next for Elijah and why God, God was saying, I'm not done. So go ahead in, in the last verses here, Josiah. Uh, so verse 19, Elijah departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. So we see here that Elijah's not done, right? There's a whole reason why God was sent the angel, wake up, you gotta eat, you gotta eat, we gotta keep going. Go meet me at this place. I'm, I'm gonna speak, don't worry. You're gonna hear my still small voice, but keep going. But go ahead, Josiah, what, so explain these last couple of verses here as he's entering with Elisha. So Elijah, he's 
again, just been through so much over the past three years. He uh, is completely worn out. He's thinking that he's done and he goes to God and he's completely vulnerable before him and just opens up and says, this is where I'm at right now. And God says, now go and take everything that we've been through and go pour into Elisha. Yeah. Go allow him to be your servant, allow him to learn from you. And Elisha goes and lives this crazy life. He uh, gets double the uh, miracles that Elijah himself does. And that faith that Elijah had to be able to pray that the rain would stop, to be able to live being fed by ravens, yeah. to experience all of these miracles. He teaches and passes that on to someone yeah. who otherwise would have lived his entire life as a farmer and never been able to experience everything that God had for him. Yeah. And so Elijah is used to pour into the next generation yeah. that ends up uh, just continuing that work and glorifying God all the more. Yeah, yeah. It's so amazing because he says he's not done. And then he goes, I, I'm, you need to train the next one. You got to train the next one because Elisha, Elisha's going to do even more greater things to come, but it stems off of you, Elijah. It stems off of you, and we're not done here, so keep going. Pour into Elisha so he can continue the mantle on, so he can proclaim my name and, and do more miracles than even you. What an amazing thing that we see here. But again, taking a step back, we see at that moment, again, darkest moment that we see in Elijah's life. God says, I'm not done. I'm not done. So maybe that's where you're at today. Where you say, I, I am done. I, I, I don't want to deal with this. Or you're just in such a, a mindset of depression and anxiety, whatever it is. What I'm saying as a church is we, we, we read this text is tell somebody. Tell somebody. Obviously, give that to the Lord. Lay it before his feet. Just like Elijah did. He didn't hide it. He said it. He said it out loud to God and said, look, God, this is, this is my heart right now. This is where I'm at. Don't keep it inside. Give it to God. But also allow the church body to come around you, link arms with you, and, and, and walk with you through this. We see um, God's plan through this whole thing as Elijah faced disappointment, again, after his expectations about the outcome of his actions were not met. Elijah wanted to see immediate revival, but he didn't see it. God had a plan that he was working out that even Elijah didn't even see. That's so much like our lives, right? Where we're, we're going in the midst of these things and we're dealing with these situations and we don't see the end, we don't see the outcome. We just see the devastation today. We just see the heartbreak today. But God's saying, keep going because on the other side of this, I have something for you. Believe me, I do. And when you finally get there, you're gonna look back and go, I see it, God, I see it. And it's awesome that we have the opportunity to do that. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says this, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Hear those words. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. So think of the best thing you can imagine. And he says, it's far beyond that. Far beyond it. And he doesn't end there, he continues. And he says, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isn't that a beautiful verse? He's saying the thing that you can fathom, those one things you can think about, that maybe these are the best things. He's saying, my ways are far beyond any of those things. And then we see God with Elijah. As Elijah sought after God, he found him in that still small voice. Elijah in his despair, he needed hope, and he found it when he drew near to God and entered into his presence. You want hope? You gotta grow closer to the Lord. You gotta go find him. You, you sit, sometimes we sit back and we go, we, we sit in our bubble, you know, our bubble of depression or anxiety. We know these things exist and we know that they're real, but a lot of times we feel like we can't do anything. And God is just crying, he's crying out to you saying, look, I'm here. I'm here in the midst of that, in that box that you place yourself in, I'm right here. You just have to listen to my voice. Hear me, I'm here for you. In that darkest valley, I will walk with you and we can do this together because in your lowest of lows I will show you my strength and I will lift you out of this it's possible it is possible but lay it at his feet 
Lay it at his feet. Give it to him. He wants to take on those burdens. And so we see God with Elijah as he's in that desperation in Romans 5. He says this. It'll end with the verse that we uh, claim as our church, just the verse that we hold on to. It says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. So many of us that have been through trials and different things, we know that at the end of those trials, we can see the endurance, right? Because we're able to go through things, go through things in our life that give us strength, that, that can take us through the next time we deal with something. Because we know there's going to be growth from those situations. We know there's going to be growth from those times that are very difficult because we're going to learn for the next time. But also, we didn't go through that to do it alone. We went through it so one day we can pass on the mantle, right? So we can say, look, yes, I went through this years ago, but I went through it so God can help me through it so he can give me the strength, but now I can teach other people, hey, you're not alone. I've been through that as well, and guess what? God showed up. So this is how he showed up in my life. Spend time with him. Let's pray together. Let's do this together. But the point is, maybe today you're in the midst of a battle. You're in the midst of depression. You're in the midst of anxiety, whatever it is. God is your hope. Yeah, but also man. one day he's going to use that radically in your life because he has a plan for it. He has a plan for it. He isn't just alive to go through it for no reason. He has something at the very end, but keep pushing through. Keep getting through it. Realize that he's the one that died for your sins on that cross. He didn't die for no reason. He died for you that's sitting in this chair. He died for those that in this valley that desperately need him. He died for every single one of us for a purpose. And that's because, guess what? You have a purpose on this earth. He's given you a purpose. And many of you this morning go, I don't know what that is yet. I have not seen that in my life. Maybe you're 40, 50, 80, whatever it is, 12. And you say, I don't know what that is. Are you listening? Are you hearing him? Are you spending time with him? What's taking place? Because I guarantee you he's speaking. We just have to be listening. Yeah. We have to listen. And lastly, what this ultimately comes down to is, is Elijah, again, being used as I finish Romans really quick. It says, develop endurance in verse 4 continues, and endurance develops strength into character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope does not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. That hope doesn't disappoint. It doesn't disappoint. And though, yes, there's times of disappointment in our life, we know that there's reality we feel like God didn't do something or we're disappointed with God, it's because ultimately, let's be honest, church, it's because it didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. It's true. That's why. It's not that God didn't show up. It's because it didn't happen the way we wanted it. Right? And as Elijah, again, is in that moment of despair, he's saying, you know what, I'm done to these things. We see that God's not done. God's with him. But it's ultimately for discipleship. As Elijah was given a purpose in his hopelessness, he was given a purpose there and a ministry unique to him. God did not take Elijah at that time because he still had a task for Elijah to accomplish. He still wanted to use Elijah. He said, no, I need you again to pour into Elisha and so he can continue the ministry. In Philippians 1, it says this, for to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. He's saying, why? Because we know that home is better. We know that heaven is better. Yeah. But he's saying, because I'm going to stay here so I can do the work of Christ. So I can be furthering the gospel so I can continue the work that he's, he's called me to do. I'm torn between the two desires, as it says in verse 23. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far are better. This is Paul speaking. But for your sake, it is better that I continue to live. Why? So we can continue to proclaim God's name. So we can continue to proclaim the gospel. So we continue to see other lives radically change. Because guess what, church? Every single one of us needs hope. And the only place to find it is in Jesus. Yeah. That's it. So wherever you're at today, the point again of this series is this. That we would lay those things at the feet of Jesus. Wherever we are, the struggles, the sins, the past, maybe we haven't let go of those things. It's saying, let him go. Lay it at his feet. 
God has something great for you, but you got to give up those things to Him. you got to hand it over to Him. He wants those things. As last week, as I mentioned, your name is in the past things. That's not what God calls you. He calls you your name. Whatever that is. It's not anxiety. It's not depression. It's not fear. For me, he says, David is your name. And I've called you to this. For you, it's put your name there. He has a purpose for your life. Don't be stuck there. Hand it over to him. Give him all of those things. I guarantee you, God's going to do something radical in that work. Just give it to him. Let's stand and let's worship this morning.